The following is a combined statement and conversation analysis of one of Special Agent Graham Coder's interviews of Chris Watts prior to Chris's confession. The Chris you're looking at right now wants these kids and his wife back at his house right now. At this point in time, Chris's family is just missing. In statement analysis, it's understood that people can't help but tell the truth in small bits and pieces, even when, or exactly because, they're trying to conceal it. Lying is stressful for the brain. I have no idea like where they went. In this video, I'll point out and explain keywords and phrases that reveal parts of Chris's personality and thought patterns, as you would in a formal analysis. I hope you find it informative. If you've come across my channel before, welcome back, I'm glad you're here. If you're new here, welcome aboard. This channel is all about language analysis. If you like this video, consider subscribing. It helps me out a lot when you do that. Let's get to it. I can tell that there's just something you're not telling me. And I'm not sure what it is. I don't know why that is. I don't know why you're not telling me that there's something that's making you a little bit uncomfortable tonight. I just don't believe some of the things you're telling me. Okay, I just don't. I simply do not believe you. In everyday conversations, we as human beings hold back expressions that would threaten the other person's face. So we make polite disagreements like yes but or you're right but for as long as possible. However, it's standard procedure for the investigator to break these conversational rules. Coders, I simply do not believe you is unapologetic and unambiguous. This is an intimidating tactic. This just doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't add up. So can we talk about two Chris's? Okay. Two Chris's. The tale of two Chris's? Okay. Um, and you need to help me know which Chris I'm looking at today and which Chris you really are. By setting up the idea of two Chris's, Coda indirectly gives Chris leeway to speak as the quote unquote other Chris. People with guilty knowledge, like Chris, don't object as much as innocent people do. Sometimes they don't object at all. Coda even makes Chris say he's okay with this. But notice the presupposition here that Chris silently agrees with, that he hasn't told the truth. A more eerie observation here is that Coda may actually tap into Chris's own belief that he is indeed two persons. In the confession interview, Chris made sure to mention that he felt like two persons. Every time I think about it, I'm just like, did I know I was going to do that before I got on top? Or? Really? That's an interesting thought, Chris. Mm -hmm. You don't know if you did. So like, there was already something in my mind that I was implanted that I was going to do it, and I woke up that morning, it was going to happen, and I had no control of it. It's kind of like I just saw my life just disappearing before my eyes, but I just like I couldn't let go. It was like somebody else, like, like if you picture somebody else around you, holding your hands, holding you, keep you from not, not letting you. Murderers often distinguish between two versions of themselves. This may be for self-serving reasons. To appear normal on the surface to therefore come across as more frightening when the switch happens. As appears to be the case for a Ted Bundy. It was like coming out of some kind of horrible trance or, or dream. Um, I can only liken it to after, you know, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but to have been possessed by something so awful and so alien, and then the next morning wake up from it. What happens is once it, it has been more or less satisfied and received, you might say, or spent that, that sense, that kind of energy level recedes, and basically I became my, myself again. I, I want people to understand this too, and I'm not saying this gratuitously because it's important people understand this. That basically, I was a normal person. Uh, uh, However, Chris is a lot less self-glorifying and assertive than Bundy. So setting up the idea of two versions of himself may help Chris repress his memories and live on. The brain is designed to seek the outcome which causes the least internal stress. This is also why lying is difficult to most people. So, Chris number one is right here, right? And fell out of love with his wife, okay? Started wondering what it might be, 
he didn't have a wife to take care of and a girl to take care of. Spent some time alone, liked that time alone, came home, may or may not have had a conversation about how to get out of this marriage or how to fix it, but probably how to get out of it. Is looking at a bachelor pad in Brighton and did something terrible to his wife and kids. And that may have been an accident, and I think it was an accident. Mentioning the accident part gives additional leeway for Chris to tell the truth, making it easier for him. Coda has already removed full responsibility with the idea of two Chris's, and now Coda also introduces the idea of an accident. That's not the Chris you're looking at right now. Chris's first presupposition here is that there are in fact two Chris's, so he's actually agreeing with Coda now. When Chris says right prior to now, he's limiting his language and linguistically presupposing that there are times when he's the other Chris. In conversation analysis, we note pauses that exceed two seconds, because they may suggest that the subject, for whatever reason, finds the preceding statement problematic. Here, the delayed response, along with Chris's unassertive and almost trembling tone of voice, points to deception. Again, Coda breaks conversational rules by not acknowledging Chris's utterances. Acknowledging the other speaker is a fundamental rule to keep a conversation going. This rule violation is visibly making Chris uncomfortable, and he overemphasizes with a low-key no. Also, notice his overcompensating and hyperbolic reassurances in the following. The Chris you're looking at is the man who loves these kids and loves his wife and will never, ever, ever do anything to harm them. That's the Chris you're looking at right now. The Chris you're looking at right now wants these kids and his wife back at his house right now. That's the Chris you're looking at. Chris makes four separate utterances but the expected personal pronoun I is nowhere to be found. Instead, Chris continues presupposing and thereby indirectly acknowledging the two versions of him. Notice how he repeats the Chris you're looking at four times in this short passage. This is highly sensitive to him. He's looking at himself from the outside, so we expect him to use the possessive pronoun his, as we see with his wife, which is repeated twice. However, notice how he uses these instead of his when mentioning the kids. We've observed this earlier when Chris used those instead of my to refer to his children. What about the girls? Bella and Celeste are light of my life. I'd do anything for those girls. I'd step in front of a bullet for the train for those girls. There's a disconnection in Chris's language, a lack of affection. Also, he doesn't say daughters, just kids, which is impersonal. That's the Chris you're looking at. Why didn't you call 911? I didn't think anything was wrong. Innocent people react with anger and resentment towards any question or statement that casts doubt upon their innocence. Chris doesn't. We've seen him play along with Coda's idea of the two Chris's. And now we hear him defend himself with this low-key answer. Notice the breath in his voice. I didn't think anything was wrong. This sounds more like an appeal to be pitied than Chris sounding convincing. And it reveals the internal stress he's experiencing, making him sound exhausted. I think you knew what was wrong. I did not know what was wrong, sir. Chris says sir when he feels pressured. We observe this again later. Besides this formal address, he, consciously or not, observes another politeness rule. Parroting. Parroting is applied all the time in everyday conversations. When you're talking to a friend, notice how often the two of you end up using the same words and definitions. In this interview setting, parroting is the least stressful way of answering, because the subject can just reuse the agent's words, and sound polite at the same time. I promise you 
statement analysis views a statement like this as extra words that the subject didn't need to say unless they were trying to make an extra effort, spend extra time to try to persuade. Promise is understood as a common marker of deception. In the following, notice how Coda seeks to increase Chris's internal stress to get him to a breaking point. We're back to his tale of two Chris's, Chris. Okay. Is it Chris who cares? Um, I care. I promise. Tell me about the call to your daycare. To the primrose? I called them to see if the girls were there. They said they weren't there. Okay. I told them since they weren't there, just put them back on the waiting list. That's not what you told me. I told him that we were going to sell the house. Or we could put it on the market or probably won't be in the area anymore. That's two different things, Chris. Well, I wanted them to be back on, on I put them on the, on the waiting list since they weren't there. Why weren't they there? I don't know. Where were they going to go? They went to a, Snan took them to a friend's house. Why wouldn't they go to daycare? I am not sure. Uh, honestly, sir, I am not sure. Chris ends up saying sir again, so by now we know he feels pressured. He says honestly, which makes the investigator ask, why the use of this word now? Why the need to overemphasize? And also, does the use of honestly at this point suggest that the subject hasn't been truthful up until now? Also, notice his posture. He looks wounded, like someone who's given up, while Coda still assumes the attack position, leaning towards him. It's hard for me as a father to talk to you about this. Uh -huh. Not because it's a hard issue to talk about. It's because I'm worried about your daughters under your care. Unlike ordinary conversations, Coda keeps being direct and unambiguous. It's an effective tool to slowly get the subject to crack. Let's see how Chris answers. You shouldn't have to worry about them under my care. Okay. I watched them all weekend. I went to went to a pool party, went to a pool party at Jeremy Lindstrom's house. It's like, I love those kids with all my heart. And nothing in this world would ever make me do anything to these kids or my wife. With shouldn't, Chris gives Coda advice about what he believes is the correct thing for Coda to do, to not worry. However, Chris doesn't rule out that there could be something to worry about. Chris again parrots Coda, using his words instead of coming up with his own, which is harder. Self repairs indicate internal stress. He's gone from these to the distant those, even though the pictures of his daughters are right in front of him. This speaks to the internal disconnection we've observed every time he mentions his kids, as he calls them. With all my heart is a persuasive expression overemphasizing the exact kind of love that Chris truly can't express naturally and believably. Also, its so-called pathos appeal to emotion and pity, as opposed to logos. Apparently, Chris has given up on trying to persuade Coda with logic. Answering in the negative increases the sensitivity of what Chris is stating. In general, truthful people aren't concerned with what they wouldn't do, but what they would do, maybe protect or fight for their family. Chris is the one introducing the action verb do, and thereby indirectly implies that he has in fact done something. Notice the difference in pronouns. He says these about his kids, but my about his wife. Obviously, this distinction is sensitive to Chris, and it shows linguistic distancing to his daughters. This is unexpected speech behavior for a father, and points to guilty knowledge. In the following, notice how Coda's response presupposes that Chris still hasn't told the truth. Notice the irritation in Chris's voice now that his attempts at appealing to Coda's emotions have failed. When you walk out of this room, there's nothing I can say to a room full of police officers that's going to convince them that you have nothing to do with this. I know. You know what they think. I, I know what all they call it. Yeah. Here's a guy who didn't call 911. Who woke his wife up at a ridiculous hour because he was so guilty about something that he had to get it off his chest and say, I don't love you anymore, I'm leaving you. That didn't go well. Okay, so what happened? It's 
she told me she wanted me to wake her up before I left. That's why I didn't just wake her up, like, just to tell her this. Like, I woke her up. That's what she wanted to do, and we talked. Like, usually at 4 a.m., I wake up, I go down and work out. This day, I wanted to talk to her about this. In the next excerpt, notice Coda's withholding of acknowledgement and the awkward 16 second pause as a result of this. I love these girls. I love these girls so much. And this picture right here, Celeste and Bella, those are my life. I am helped make those kids. There's nothing in my life that means more to me than these kids. Nothing. He's struggling so much to express true emotions that he constantly uses extra words to do it, unnecessary language. Kids has now been changed to girls, not once has Chris called them his daughters. These girls could apply to strangers as well. We can literally see Chris using different tactics to appeal to Coda's emotions. Here, Chris tries to direct Coda's attention, manipulating him since the picture has been on the table for a long time. So Chris is not showing us or telling us something new. It's just a new tactic. Those implies distance. So even though Chris actually points to the picture and mentions his daughter's names, he's still using a distancing pronoun. He's again expressing himself in the negative, thereby opening up for the possibility that there is in fact something or someone that means more to him than these kids. Kids, that's, that's your life. That's your lifeline. That's everything. Like You make kids, they come first before anything. Kids, spouse, family. That's what it's always been. Chris goes from personal to general observations. We notice his use of you and your. As a result, he's not speaking about how he's feeling, but about how he should be feeling, associating with normality. And that's very different. Nothing you've told me tonight makes sense. Nothing you've told me tonight feels like the truth. Can we start over? Sure. Instead of objecting to the fact that Coda doesn't believe him, Chris just says sure to the question about starting over. This amount of patience and politeness is unexpected if we're dealing with truthful people. Let's see what happens. I think that there's something that happened that got maybe a little bit out of control. There was no fight, there was nothing physical. It was a, it was a conversation, there was, there was no, we didn't raise our voice, nothing. I promised you that, so there was, there was nothing physical with this conversation. We don't hear a flat out rejection. We don't hear him say no. Instead, he brings up all the things that could have been, prefacing them with a negation. Twice, he says there was nothing physical. He's the one introducing this word, making the subject of physicality sensitive to him. It points to the fact that something physical actually happened. When we find the guy who took him, what do you think we should do? This question is asked because it's expected that an innocent person will want that to be very drastic consequences. Typically, an innocent person would say highly politically incorrect things here. However, notice the three second pause before Chris answers, and in a hesitant manner. Honestly, like, they're going to come home safe, correct? When you find the guy. When we find the guy, they're going to come home. Life in prison would be the... That's what, I would, that's what I would think with two kids that are involved. What if he hurt them? Did 
it's not, it's, I'm not sure if like that penalty is even used, is it used in Colorado? I'm not even sure what is the death penalty. Okay. Um, I mean like if these kids are not alive, like there's no, there's nothing you could do to, to cope with that, to make me cope with that if those kids are not okay. Notice the multiple hedges, expressing probability rather than certainty. Also, we observe several self-repairs, indicating difficulty in answering. Normally, the answer to this type of question is straightforward, but Chris is almost negotiating with himself. In this passage, the distance he feels to his children is made very clear. It's like he's not talking about his own flesh and blood. In relation to this, he first says, there's nothing you can do to cope with that, until he changes it to, to make me cope with that. Chris puts vowel stress on me, as if realizing that he forgot to say it. Because as we've seen, Chris is inclined to speak generally, not personally. And the me utterance is an appendix, not the syntactic focus. Alright. Um, tonight's been pretty intense, I can imagine. How are you feeling? <laughs> I've, I've slept like two hours last night, so I'm like running on empty right now, but I know. I can see it. Chris may think the formal part of the interview is over. However, when the investigator gives the subject this impression, they're trained to keep analyzing said subject. Sometimes the subject gives themselves away the most when they think it's over. So Here, I'm you like hear Chris's right exhalations, now, indicating relief. But then you ask, why is the subject relieved? Because they've experienced internal stress. And then the key question, why have they experienced internal stress? So why do I do this? I'm sure you don't mind if we take a break for the night. Um, and I'm sure that you are um, feeling some of the pressure from me. Okay? You're doing your job. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't grill you a little bit, right? Okay. I've seen you tell two different guys. Like, <laughs> honestly, like I've seen like, where you're smiling, and I've seen where... It's it's different. Yeah. I, I can, yeah. Okay. I'm doing your job though. Like, I can't yeah. fault you for anything you've asked. Chris says Coda's doing his job, and even that he can't fault Coda for anything he's asked. This type of politeness of sucking up is atypical for innocent people, and it indicates that they have some level of guilty knowledge. Chris is laughing. Honestly, like his I wife and like daughters are still missing, really yet he's able to laugh, and really the laughter right. sounds yeah. sincere. The laughter is a result of Chris's relief. But what he may not realize is that it makes him sound selfish and insensitive. In the following, notice how Coda ends where he started, with the idea of the two Chris's. To Coda, the interview is clearly not over. Now Coda is the one appealing to Chris's feelings. Listen to this. So we had this Chris, right? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the other Chris. Is it right here? Okay. I can see that you're a good man, right? You don't have beautiful daughters with good clothing that look well fed, right? Children that are unhappy don't smile like this, okay? And those are beautiful kids. Those kids have a good dad, and I know it. Let's just get a picture of someone for them. Yeah. It's a better one, but it's just... I'm sorry, too. It's those kids have a good dad good dad that feeds him and loves him. I was very impressed when I asked you how their day was about how involved you are. Okay. See you on the weekend. A lot of dads don't get second pairs of clothes and cook eggs and give them snacks at night. You know, a lot of, a lot of men, that's woman's work, right? I don't like to get involved. But you're not that kind of guy. Okay. So, Chris, can you just look at me for one second? If there is something that happened, it's okay. It really is. Yeah. Okay. If something that happened with these girls, if there was an accident, if there is something you're afraid to tell me, it's okay. In the last excerpt we're about to see and hear, notice how Coda mixes informal talk with some of the harder issues that he and Chris just talked about. His informal body posture contributes to the impression 
that he's now just being friendly with Chris. So we'll do that. We're going to send you home, go to your friend's house, get a good night's sleep, um, pick up your dad at 8 or 9. Yeah, it's not to verify with you. Is it like 5 Eastern morning? time? He already has a ticket? Yeah. Do you know what, when he's flying in? Like what he's flying in on or the company? Or I told him to go to United Airlines. It was cheaper, but I'm not okay. sure because the kept, price kept changing on him. He bought his ticket? Yeah. Okay, what's his name? Ronnie Watts. Ronnie Watts, okay. Um, so we'll send you to your friend's house. You know, again, I can't tell you, you cannot go in your house, but I'd like you to not go in your house um, if you can do that. And then we'll start early in the morning. I'll check in with you at around 8 or 9. Okay. Um, you'll probably be on your way to the airport if not already there. And then can you, after that, can you just come straight here? Yeah. Let's let's talk. Let's get everything out of the way. Let's get done with your search. And then we're just going to, you know, send you on your way. And we'll be back to this Chris, the good Chris, right? Okay. Um, I'm sorry you have to go through all this. It's part of the process. Okay. So you guys can stay in my house overnight, or? I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. Um, and, but actually, yes. <laughs> okay. They w there will be someone at your house. Okay. Uh, there will be a patrol officer in the front and in the back. In conclusion, Chris struggles with expressing the emotions that he claims to have for his wife and children. He prefers general and distancing expressions to personal ones and his overly convincing language points to deception. Chris makes himself sound guilty. I'll see you in the next video. There's, it's like, it's vanished. Like, she's not, like, when I got home yesterday, it was like a ghost town. Like, she wasn't here. Kids weren't here.